Welcome everyone back. Um, over the time, Tsuji mission from charity expanded to medicine, education, hum humanistic culture, disaster relief, and environmental protection, not only in Taiwan, but around the world. Yet, today we are living in an ever-changing world where everything around us will not stop changing, no matter if it's the improvement of technology or there are many much more to mention. But has Tsuji missions changed for the past 55 years or has Tsuji's initial mission and vision, and vision stayed the same? Let us today kindly invite um, our brother Joe to give us an overview of Tsuji's mission and share to us how in this ever-changing world, Tsuji's never-changing mission. Thank you, brother Joe. Okay, thank you, Natalia, and uh, welcome everybody. And uh, yes, we have begun our session uh, um, and good day to everybody. Uh, I understand that everybody were in different time zones, mm -hmm. and therefore uh, it's very difficult to say whether it's good morning, good afternoon, or good evening. But I think whether uh, wherever we are and whatever the time zone that we are in, I think the most important thing is our heart is in the same place, the same place where our message Chengen wants us to be, which is love, loving all the time. Whether you are an, in the evening, in the afternoon, in the morning, the most important thing is our heart is always in the time of love, love and giving. And today we are going to share with you, where I'm going to share with you the four missions. And especially in this ever changing world with this never changing mission. And um, it is my honor to be able to present to, to you my thoughts and my um, my feelings about our four missions. I think in this world, we are very customary to the disasters that's happening in the world. Right now, um, in Australia, there is flooding that is probably never seen before in, in the last 50 to 100 years. The rain that came down is so much more that is two, two to three times the average rain that in the past 50 years combined. And that is a lot. So when that comes out to be, um, when, that, when that came out, you can see that the entire flooding took place. Obviously, this is the complete opposite. Instead of being too much water, in the past two years, what we've actually seen is that the Australia wildfire was something that was even bigger. And this was a problem, as you can see, that uh, a lot of this, the fire um, congregates toward the Eastern part, uh, which is the New South Wales state. And that is also where the flood was. So you can imagine that the disaster kept on changing. The problems that we're facing in the world are constantly changing. And these are posing are very, very serious problems for all of us. And in, last, in, in, in this year also, just a couple months ago, today we are the end of March, but just about a month ago in February 16th, the US also was hit with this winter storm that was never seen before in Texas. And because this was a state that was not known for its cold weather, Actually, all the infrastructure, the people, the buildings, all the uh, water, the transportation, the buildings, none of this was prepared for the winter storm. And that could tell you that the disasters are changing. It's getting bigger in scale. It's getting different in the way that it poses challenge to us. So the world keeps on changing but are we changing with them? In 2021, we also were hit with the Indonesian Sulawesi earthquake. And this was actually happened a couple of years ago too, but these are the things that kept on happening. Also in 2020, we remember the wildfire in, in, uh, in Northern California in the US, also happened in Colorado, Oregon, 
the entire West Coast of the United States. They all got on fire. And that was something that was also uh, once in the ages. We don't see this very often. And we don't see this um, very frequently. But now we are seeing them all over the places. We see them in the Amazons. We see them in Australia. We see them in the US. This is happening. And the disasters kept on getting bigger. And the disasters kept on getting more severe. And they're also changing in their variety. In the 2020, the Atlantic hurricane season, they also broke a record. In the past, the average of about 15 hurricanes a year, in the, in the year 2020, there was, a, a le there was over 30 hurricanes. And most of them were, uh, be eventually became um, category three plus. And we understand that this was a huge difference. And why are all these things happening? Because of the climate change, because of what the human, uh, the human factors, what we're doing to our planet, to our world. And that is why all these things are happening more. And in Vietnam, Cambodia, the flooding also came because of too much water in too short a time. In the past, the rain will still fall, but it will fall in a, in a very paced way, meaning that it will fall the same amount, but it will take a stretch. It would take a week. It would take a month or a two weeks to finish the entire rainfall. But now the rain all comes down in less than a day or two. And now the water has nowhere to go. And we also heard Brother Alfredo talked about uh, the super typhoon Haiyan. But did you also know that in year 2020, there was also a super typhoon Ghani that took place? The damage is not as, um, as severe as Haiyan, but this super typhoon Ghani also was very disastrous to the Philippines as well. And obviously, we all know that in 2019, starting 2019 to 2021, we actually know that, and we are still in the COVID-19 pandemic. We knew that it started sometime in 2019, the late 2019, and then 2020, February, it began to spread and eventually went to the Europe and eventually went to the US and eventually to Central South America and then go to um, the entire Africa, Midwest, uh, Mideast, and then Asia also, Australia. No place is safe. No place is safe from the COVID-19 pandemic. And it's everywhere. It still is. And it's getting worse with all the variants. So we can see that all these things are ever-changing. We can see that the disasters, whether, na whether by nature or man-made, are always changing. It's almost like a test that is coming to us and the questions keep on changing. So how would you be able to study and prepare for this test where the questions keep on changing? And we also know about the vaccine that is, that is going through around the world. Um, it is our hope that the vaccine will stop and also will at least slow down the spread of the pandemic. So what can we do knowing and seeing that all these, all these problems, all these um, man-made and natural disasters keep on happening all over the place? What can we do? There are many things that we can do, but as this situation is always changing, there's one thing that never changes. We can offer our most sincere prayer. We can offer our most sincere help. And most importantly, we can offer our most sincere love. And that is the theme of today. What doesn't change in this world where everything changes? It must be our resolve. It must be our vow where we want to keep love in this world. And that is through our actions. So with this, um, with this world that keeps on changing, the one thing that remains the same are our four missions. As I mentioned, what keeps the same is this love. And through our actions, through our missions, we show what this love is made of. We show how we can care for the people that are in need through these four 
major missions of Ziji. You probably have heard about it from uh, Brother Alfredo. You probably have heard about it from different people um, as you are going through Ziji Foundation. As you are learning, as you are becoming a Ziji volunteer, you probably know about the mission of charity, the mission of medicine, the mission of education, and the mission of humanistic culture. You probably heard about this. But today, we're going to tell you a different perspective on what the four missions are. They don't change. They remain the four missions. But the core of them, what they actually bring for us, it changes throughout time so that we can adapt to this world, so that we can adapt to all the problems that we're facing. So these are the four missions, the mission of charity, the mission of medicine, the mission of education, and the mission of humanistic culture. Now let us go through each one of them and see what they are supposed to do for this changing world. So we could see that um, in this world that there are these earth, fire, wind, and water disasters. We know that because this is the world that we live in. What we just exp explained in the world uh, in the past year, in the past two years, in the past three years, that's what we've seen, right? We've seen the earthquakes, we've seen the forest fire, we've seen the hurricanes, and we've seen the floodings, whether it's in Australia, the, the, the US fires or the hurricane season in the Atlantic or the Pacific and the earthquake in the, in the rim of fire, all these things are happening in the world. And the people that are in need, whether they're affected by these natural disasters or not, are there and they need our help. So what do we do? We go to these places, we provide them with these relief items. Not only do we provide them with these blankets, with the rice, also we provide this, uh, this timely help so that we could, our volunteers could be there. We go there to provide the hot food, serve the hot meals, and we are there to provide the, um, the lodging and also showing people that we are there with them. These are the forms of charity that we see on the outside. But today we're going to talk about what is this mission of charity redefined? What is it redefined? What is it? It's not just about distribution. It's not just about giving the blankets. It's not just about giving this food. It's not just about what do I give you? It's not just about what you get from Ziji. And it's not just about helping you or helping them. So what is this mission of charity really about? It's about caring. It's about connecting. And it's about hope. What does that actually mean? What do you mean by caring? What do you mean by connecting? And what do you mean by hope? Let's talk about this story. Now, this story happened about maybe about five, about five or four years ago. I remember, I remember this story very vividly because it's a story that touches my heart as well. It made me realize things that I didn't know before. This was the, this was the forest wildfire that happened in Canada. I heard these stories, I think it's probably more than five years ago. I heard this story many times from our volunteers in Canada. And then I found more about, uh, more about the, um, the, uh, the details of the story. And this is what I'm gonna tell you today, the stories of this forest fire in Canada. As you can see, when the fire took, when the fire broke out, everybody escaped. They all ran out from the fire and they all want to go to somewhere safe. They pack all their things and belongings into the car and they drove their families and all the way hundreds and hundreds of miles and kilometers away from the fire. This is something that you would do for your family. This is something that I would do for my family if it were to happen. You can see all the cars, they're going in one direction and then going all to the safety areas. Our volunteers out in the safe, out in the safety relocated areas, they go there and they provide a help. We have a stand there. We have a 
location within the relocated centers. So you see all these people, they come in, they are the relocated evacuees. They were evacuated from their homes, they have their belongings, but they might need more additional help. Therefore, our volunteers are there to provide them with the blankets. Now, these are the blankets that many of you should already know about, but I'm gonna just explain them, explain to you a little bit. These are the blankets that were made from the plastic bottles, the PET bottles. They're done through this chemical process where we make the threads out of the PET bottles and then we make them into blankets. They feel very soft and they are very warm and they're very light. So it's a perfect combination for people that are on the move when they need something warm. And lo and behold, this is the perfect opportunity. So when these evacuees, when these evacuated citizens of Canada, they're running away from the fire, they came to the relocated center, our volunteers are there to explain to them what these blankets are. And you can see that this child, it really after long hours, long hours, of traffic, long hours of travel, getting away from the fire, you feel this blanket, it feels like home because it's very soft on the touch. And I'm sure if some of you have gotten this blanket before, and as I have a blanket of my own, I know how it feels. You know, when you touch it, it doesn't feel like you're touching a plastic bottle, a blanket that is made from plastic bottle. When you touch it, it really feels like very smooth, very silky. It feels like it's part of you. It feels warm. So we have a, we have a volunteer, this lady, who, who were there volunteering for our, uh, for our stand and who was there uh, helping to distribute the blankets that you see there. And the same way that she was a local resident, she was not an evacuee. So she was there to help all the evacuees getting their blankets. But as she was holding onto the blanket, you could tell that she was hugging the blanket because it feels warm, because it feels soft. And so she was hugging it. One day when she was about to leave, this volunteer asked our volunteer, ask him, can I have a blanket for myself? Now, for all of you, our new volunteers, and our friends from different places and different countries. Now we should know that these blankets are for the evacuees. So even though they feel very nice and even though they feel very soft on the touch, they are for the people that need them. We as volunteers do not take these. So our volunteer, the person on the left, reply in a very polite way, reply to her, saying that, sister, we are here to volunteer our time. We're here to give our love. And therefore, this blanket here, it's not for us. We should not take them. So this, these blankets are only for the evacuees. That's what they need, but we're gonna give it to them, but not for ourselves. We're gonna give the blankets to the people that need them. And so this volunteer, this lady then continued, I think I need them. Our volunteer asked, why? She said, I've just finished one week of volunteering with Siji Foundation. I've seen you guys do some amazing, impossible things. People come in and people go. When they come in, I see their face. They're sad and filled with sorrow. When they go, when they go with this blanket, I see their faces are smiling again. I think there is some magic in this blanket. And right now I need this magic. Now our volunteer was very curious. What do you mean you need this magic? What magic is this? This is a blanket. The only magic that was here was that it was made from a PET bottle. And the PET bottles are collected by all the, all the volunteers. So I don't see what, the, what magic there is in this blanket. The lady replied, because I'm a cancer patient and I'm about to undergo chemotherapy. I don't know what's gonna happen. In the past week, I'm here with you volunteering, 
but now I must take my leave because I need to go through chemotherapy. And I think right now I need this magic. I need something to comfort me, to let me hold on to. So I know that there is something to smile about because I've seen so many people smiling after getting this blanket. So our volunteer said, yes, the blanket is for the needy. In this case, you need this blanket. So I'm going to give you, give it to you and the best wishes to you as you undergo your chemotherapy. So the lady left and he, she went home. On her way home, she went to see her friend. Her friend also has a 10 year old daughter who is also a cancer patient, but her cancer state was a lot worse. When she took the bus, our lady friend took the bus, grabbed this blanket, hug it in front of her, get on the bus and go to her friend's house. Before she could enter the house, she could hear the cries from within the house. She right away knew that it was the daughter that was crying. She right away knew that it was the daughter that was crying. Why? Because of extreme pain and discomfort. The lady, lady volunteer walked in quietly and saw her friend, which is the mother and father of the 10 year old child who was crying out loud. You could see their facial expressions. It was sad. They don't know what to do. They could not stop the cries. They could not stop the pain. I'm sure as any parents would do, they would rather the pain and discomfort be on their own body than to be on their own daughter. But there's nothing that they could do. There is no magic to transfer this pain to the parents. So what did she do? Our volunteer did the only thing she knew she could do, did the only thing she knew how to do in the past seven days, volunteering for Tsuji Foundation. Whenever she saw anyone crying, she would go up to them, take this blanket and wrap it around them and comfort them. And that's what she did. She took this blanket that was in front of her, open it up, go to the crying child. Wrap in the same way, in the same way that she, she knew how to do. In the same way that she knew how to do in the past seven days as a volunteer for Tsuji Foundation. As magic would have it, no one knew how this was possible, but magically the child stopped crying. The child stopped crying, even started to smile. The parents couldn't believe how, and they couldn't believe why this was happening, but it did. And so she said, I don't know what I did, but I knew that the blanket has magic. And so she walked, she went home. After about two weeks, after about two weeks, she came back to us. She came back to us telling us this. That's why we know the story. She shared with us the story of how she gave the blanket to the little girl. And eventually the girl died. The girl passed away because of cancer. And the parents, because of the, their love for the daughter, said, is it possible to bury the child with the blanket? So the blanket would go with the child to be buried. And she said, okay, if that was the one thing that she felt, the daughter felt that she was safe with, then it should be, it's okay. So our volunteer came back to tell us these stories. That's how we know about these stories. There isn't a lot of pictures, but we know these stories. And so she came back and telling us the story. And when she told us the story, our volunteer wondered 
if we should give her another blanket because she need the magic to continue the fight against cancer. She said to us, I don't need another blanket because I realize that the magic wasn't the blanket. The magic is in us. The magic is in us. We already have it. Because the mission of charity is really just not about giving something. That something will help you. But the most important thing is to help the people in need finding that hope, is to allow us to give that hope to people. And, is about, and it also allow us to keep that hope. We have it in all of us. That is the mission of charity. You see all these people that are in need. What do you give them? Not just the rice. You gave them hope. You gave them the care. You gave them something more than just the rice or the blanket because you care for them. Know this. You are way more valuable than the blanket or the rice and all the food that you're giving or even the houses the construction material, you are much better. You are more than all of that because you represent hope. And that is something that we have in all of us that we can give. So that is the mission of charity, something that's redefined, no longer just about giving something to others, no longer just about giving something, building something, making something for others. It's about giving them hope something that is intangible. You can't touch hope, so you can't take it away, but you can give it to other people. So next, we're talking about the mission of medicine. And when we talk about the mission of medicine, we usually talk about hospitals. We usually talk about doctors, especially right now in the pandemic season. We talked about COVID-19. We talk about the vaccine. However, that is the all way of talking about the mission of medicine. In this new redefined mission of medicine, we no longer talk about the buildings, the infrastructure of treating people and treating patients. So it's no longer just about hospitals. Now in, in Taiwan, we have four major hospitals and three smaller regional ones. It's not just about that. We also have worldwide free clinic as well as TIMA, the Tsuji International Medical Association, the medical volunteers all around the world. But it's not just about that. It's not just about all these kind-hearted and good doctors that's giving other people hope. That's not just, it's more than that. So it's that and it's more than that. And it's not just about curing illnesses. What is it? It's about healing. See, this world, this, this word is different. It's about healing, not curing. It's about healing by caring for others, by connecting to others. I think it has a very special power. The mission of medicine. What is the mission of medicine? It's about, it's about the ability to heal, to cure, to treat all the people that are hurt whether you are hurt on the outside or whether you're hurt on the inside, whether you are hurt physically or spiritually or mentally, mission of medicine is there to heal. And how do you do that? By caring for others. That's how you heal yourself. That's how you heal yourself, which is to by, cure, by, by helping others. A couple of years ago, that there was this, uh, once again, raining season, in Burma, in Myanmar, and there was a lot of flooding. So the flooding came through, and you can imagine that in a country uh, in, in Myanmar, where it's mostly agriculture, um, you could imagine that the disaster was huge. The crops and also the farmlands are all dis destroyed because of, the, because of the rain and the flood. Worse yet, worse yet, the, the rain came down in, in different months. So you can imagine that when the farmers began to um, seed their lands, when they all plant their seeds and begin their crops, 
the rain came, the flood came, and washed away all these seeds. So the farmers have to take out the loan to buy more seeds so that they could begin their farming again. The rain came again, washed it away. This happened three times, and therefore the farmers are in very, very much in the debt. They could not overcome their debt. They could not farm anything, and the water just keeps on coming in the worst yet time. So what happened? Then Suji volunteers, we went there, we gave them the seeds, so that they could quickly grow the very first type, which is the peas. The peas require shorter time to grow. They require less resources to grow. So that's the first part where we gave them the seeds for the peas, and then we gave them the seeds in the next crop, next rotation. We gave them the seeds for the um, for the um, for the rice grains, so that they could have the peas for the initial payments and that they could have all the top grade grains in the, in the second rotation. So when they grow, when they have all these, you can imagine that they began, once they harvested, they began to um, be able to uh, be in, independent financially. They began to have some return and income so that they can allow themselves to continue the process, and we can see that after the harvest, they are really, really happy. This is after the harvest from the peas, and they're about to begin the second rotation for the, for, the, for the grains. But what is the most important thing is that we began to tell these people, tell these farmers, you know what you can do? Now you have harvested. Now you can take a little bit out of all your harvest to help others. And that's what they did. Did you know that by helping others, it helps you heal? All these people that went through something very difficult, they went through three rotations of, of farming and they all went to the water because of flooding, all got destroyed. Now they have a chance to stand up again. And now by helping others, by willingly taking a part of their harvest to help others, they are now seeing the hope that once people once gave them in the mission of charity, now they are giving that hope too to other people. This is no longer mission of charity. They are now beginning the process to heal. They are no longer, they are no longer victims of this flood. They are now the ones giving help giving hope, finding hope, and keeping that hope for other people. When they began to provide their harvest back to us, we were so overwhelmed by all this love. They came in with buckets. They came in with bags, bushels. They, they came in with all these containers just to share with us their harvest, just to share with us what they have done. And, you know, for some of them, they do not have the official container. They will come in with their own bags, taking all whatever they can to help. You can see that we had to stack up all these buckets, all these buckets of rice, all these buckets of peas. Why? Because they now know that through helping others, they see themselves no longer as victims. They see themselves not victimized by the flood, but rather enriched by this experience, by this life experience, they have healed themselves. And so not only that, but we go around while we're sharing with them, we, we told them that they could also, not only with their harvest, but they, all could, they could also deposit a little bit at a time, something that Brother Alfredo talked about in the bamboo banks. You just put in a little bit of time. That is, that changes your role. You used to be the one that take, that takes these donations because you need them. Now, I am the one that's giving this to the donation. You are no longer the victims of this flood. You are now a benefactor. You are now helping people. You are now 
kind-hearted, compassionate person that is donating to help others. That is the process of healing. You are no longer a patient. You are now the doctor. You are now a healer because you have healed yourself. That is the mission of charity, finding the hope, and the mission of medicine, which is to healing yourself. Now we move on to the third mission, which is education. What is education? When you talk about education in Taiwan, you, re you recall that there are these schools that we have built, whether it's going through, uh, whether it's because of disaster or it's because of our mission, when we build these schools and the universities, we have all these um, education uh, courses and we raise all these talents, uh, talents for the society. We build these talents, we build these schools. That's what we do. But in the redefined mission of education, a new way of thinking in the changing world, how do we maintain the mission of education, but still remain able to catch up to the new changing world? The, the mission of education, it's not just about schools. Yes, it's about schools, but it's more than that. It's not just about making sure that we have good students, the students that learn, and they also learn how to be a good person. It's not just about that. It's not just about building for future talents. Right now in, in Mozambique, there are more than 20 schools that are ready uh, in, in the uh, planning stage where we are going to help them rebuild or repair more than 20 schools in Mozambique. It's not just about building. It's not just about schools. It's not just about students. So what is this about? This is after all mission of, of education. So what is this? It's about educating. It's about letting people know what you know. It's about letting people know how you heal yourself. Letting people know how you pass on this hope. Letting people know what you have done before to bring hope to other people. And that's it. See, all these missions are connected. Mission of charity is about finding that hope. Mission, finding that hope for other people. Mission of medicine is about healing. Healing yourself by helping others. Mission of education teaches you that how do you let other people know about this? You were once hurt. You were once a victim of a natural disaster. You change your role by helping others. Now it's time for you to become the teacher by passing this education to others, sharing with people, letting them know how they can become, how they are no longer the victim and how they can become the people that helps, not the people that are helped. So it's about educating, letting people, showing people that you can care and you can heal also. So this was what uh, probably uh, many of you probably know that since year 2011, the civil war in Syria broke out. And ever since then, tens of thousands of millions of refugees flooded Central and Mideast. And I'm sure uh, right now, perhaps, uh, in, um, in Thailand, in some areas in, in Thailand, as well as in Jordan, in different countries in Turkey, there are still many, many refugees around. And in the beginning, in the beginning uh, of, the, um, of the crisis, there were many, many, there were many, many refugees that travel by land and then travel by sea. I'm sure you heard about many of these stories. And when, one of, when part of these refugees, when they were traveling by land, they went through the country called Serbia. Serbia was a country where it was landlocked and there were railroads that promised, some of them promised the refugees to bring, bring them to Europe, especially Germany, where they were able to find the new homes, new identities and a new beginning or hope. However, Due to many, many problems and many, many issues, 
These trains don't operate all the time. So you have these refugees that were stuck in Serbia in different places along the route to Europe. This is what our volunteers did. Our volunteers went there and we show them that we care. We play with them, we have food for them, and we make sure that when they're cold, we brought them jackets for the winter. So why is this important? Because we're teaching them. You see, a lot of them are children. Why? Because the parents, when they ran, when they escaped from their homes, they brought their children with them, obviously. The children means hope. Children means tomorrow. And these are the children that are running for their lives, running for their hopes for the tomorrow. Our volunteers are there to show the care. But most importantly, they educate them, show them that they could be helped to each other too. Show them that if they help each other, they could heal their own wounds and they could be people that are helping one another too. You see all these students, you see all these kids, they're there, they need help. And their help isn't just the clothing, the jacket, the food, more than that, it's education teaching them how to be a good person, passing on this knowledge of how to bring hope to others. So what we did for them is exactly that. And here I wanted to mention uh, our brother Rudolf. And he's seen here on the top left corner um, in, in the white cap. When I met him, um, he was already, he, he, he doesn't always have good health, but he's very dedicated. He dedicated himself into the work of these refugee crisis, as well as communicating with the government officials. And when we were able to go to Serbia, it was, it was mostly because of his effort to talk to the government, to talk to the locals, and also his relationship with the, with the Germany government officials that allow us, allow City Foundation and the volunteers to be able to go there and help them. And Brother Rudolph was always very dedicated. You know, you could, you could always see him, you know, even though it was very difficult for him to travel around because of his uh, conditions. It was difficult for him to walk around. I remember he, it was always difficult for him to travel back to Taiwan. But whenever he does, he always makes sure to, uh, to check on our master. And our master is always very kind and loving, making sure that Rudolph gets what he needed in terms of um, how to make himself, how to make him the most comfortable, because indeed it was not easy. And so I remember the good times with him and I remember the times where he was very dedicated and he needed the resources. And sometimes the resources aren't always there. He had to find his way to find these resources. But at the end, he did what he could to help the refugees. And I think that's very important. I used him as a role model in the mission of education, because I think this is what exactly this is, is to show that the people, not just the, the people that we're helping, but also our own volunteers, what we could do to help them, to heal themselves, to show them where the hope is, not just these relief items, not just rebuilding the rice, the blankets, it's to show that we have, in, uh, we, we have it in us, to be able to give people hope, to show that we could heal our wounds and heal other people's wounds if we begin to call people to help others. So lastly, now we come to the mission of humanistic culture. What is humanistic culture? A lot of people might think that this is about the culture aspect, which is the TV station, the monthly magazines, or all these online uh, reading material or broadcasting. I think it's not just about that. As you probably know, that all the things I'm talking about, it's not just that, right? It's not just about TV station, the drama and the programs. It's not just about the media, the websites or publication. What is this? It's actually about sharing your experience and knowledge. What is mission of humanistic culture? It's about role models, you, about what you have seen 
about what you have done. This world needs more good news. This world needs more news about kind people, about goodness in people, about the hope in people, so that hopefully we can bring hope to all corners of the world. When we are not able to go there, at least the stories, the words, the, the videos, the images will go to places where we can't go. This is the mission of humanistic culture. It's about sharing your experience. It's about teaching others to teach others, passing on your knowledge, teach them to help others, and then teach them to help, uh, teach them to help others, and then teach them to teach more people to help others. It's a passing on of this culture. It's passing on about this experience, sharing with people what you have got what you felt when you help other people, sharing about your knowledge about why and how to help people. And that's what mission of humanistic culture is. That is why Master wanted all of us to watch Dai TV whenever we can, because there are all these experiences, all these stories, all these things that help you know what you should do, especially our brothers and sisters in Africa. All of them are our role models. All of them can share with us what they have done and what they, what they are doing. And so are you. So these are the four missions. The mission of charity, which is to help us find hope, to help us keeping that hope. Mission of medicine, which is to find a way to heal people. How do we heal? By helping others. When you help others, you begin the heal, healing process. So how do you heal another person? You heal them by teaching them to help others. It's very simple. It's really, really simple. So once you help people find the hope, you also heal their wounds, and then you teach them how to teach more people to do the same. And then you share your experience. You share your experience so other people know about how to heal themselves, even though we might not be there. We might not be able to go there. The stories can, the words can, the videos can, the pictures can. So let them go and let them see the words, the videos, the stories, so then they can begin to find that hope, so that they can begin to know how to heal themselves. So what remains the same in the world that is ever-changing? The four missions remains the same. The four missions are the mission of charity, the mission of medicine, the mission of education, and the mission of humanistic culture. So why are they re remain the same? Because it always is very important to connect and care, to find that hope, and then heal yourself and heal others. And then teach others how to heal, and then teach others to teach more people. These never changes. Care and love and then heal yourself and heal others, finding that hope, and then teach others to find that hope, teach others to heal, and then teach more people to teach, these four missions never changes. It's a journey, a journey of discovery, to discover hope and love, to discover each other, to know each other, that even though we might not see each other in real person, but we know that we care and love for each other and to discover yourself, to know that, to know that you can be the vehicle to deliver the hope, to know that you can be the vehicle to deliver this love. And this journey is also known as the Bodhisattva path. And this is what Master Chen Yan has constructed for us, that as long as we are in Ziji, as long as we're in, um, in, on, in these on this path, we will be doing the four missions and we'll always be helping people find the hope. We'll always be healing each other. We'll be teaching them and we'll be sharing our experiences. And the most important thing, you can do it too. The four missions, we don't need big hospitals, big schools to do that. You can do it too. You have it in you. You are the Ziji four missions. You can go and proudly say, 
when I go to a disaster place, I can be there to help bring in the hope. I am there to help people heal. I am there to teach them how to heal, and I'm there to share my experiences. These are the four missions. You are the four missions that Siji needs. So thank you for uh, your time, and I hope that we all become the four missions. While we are committed to the four missions, we remember that it all comes from love, and this love is all inherent in all of us. We don't have to look from the outside for it. It's all in us. So going back to the story, that blanket doesn't have the magic. The magic is in all of us. You just have to believe it. You believe it, and then you will be able to find and make that hope, bring that hope to the people that most needed it. That is the true magic, and that is compassion. Thank you to all the listeners, and I hope that since this uh, this sharing, you will be much better understanding what the four missions are, and to also know that you have the power. You are the four missions. Thank you.